Hi everybody, um, I'm Neil Andrassi from City Light Filter. Um, we're based in Bath, so we're just down the road. Um, quite a lot to try and get through today. Um, I suspect I'll probably cover a lot of stuff, but in not very much detail. So if there's anything specifically that you're kind of really interested in, come share me later and maybe go through some more stuff on the laptop. Or I'll, I'll have some data and be able to walk through some stuff in a bit more detail. Um, so kind of start with a little bit about what filter does, because that's a good kind of background to my perspective on elastic. Um, we do real-time personalization for media and retail. So we've worked with customers like uh, BT, driving the personalization in the BT Vision set-top box. Um, we've worked previously with Nokia. Um, we work with uh, Maplin and Liberty of London doing retail recommendations. Um, and for us, recommendations and personalization is all about big data sets and a bit of machine learning. And the key thing for us is the real-time aspect, I think. So it's about next, next interaction and responsiveness. If you do something, um, we want to be able to respond to what you've done. And if you put something in your basket or you view a product, that's, that's useful information about where you might want to go next. Um, so you can kind of think of it like um, these kind of stories. So more like this, try this, smart search, uh, people also bought, people also watched. Those are the things that we drive for the media retail customers. Um, so, um, who's heard of Elasticsearch previously? Good. Who's used Elasticsearch previously? Less. Okay, cool. Um, Elastic have made life very, very difficult by renaming their business to product to Elastic. If you search for Elastic on Google, you don't get anything like such good results as you used to get when you search for Elasticsearch. Um, so, but the product is now called Elastic, not Elasticsearch. So if, if I say Elasticsearch, it's like myself on this. Um, um, so we've been using Elastic um, as a key part of our product for quite a number of years now, since before it was a, a proper release product we were using when it was in beta. Uh, and more recently we've started using Apache Spark, which we found to be a good partner product with that. So. So, quick overview. Um, what is Elastic? Um, it started life really as a search engine. It's a distributed search engine. Um, it also happens to be very, very good at analytics. And you can also think of it as a NoSQL database. Um, it's designed for big horizontal scalability. If you want more power, you just add more nodes. I'll show you a little bit of how to do that later. It's pretty easy to manage. Um, for a lot of scenarios, the defaults just work out the box, so that's, that's a good start. You don't need to tweak stuff when you start to get into advanced scenarios. Um, it supports structured data, so if you think of using an alternative to a SQL database with tables and columns, that probably works. If you've got unstructured data, um, lots of free text works there too. It's also pretty good with time series based data. Um, with time series data and analytics, it's actually a very, very strong product. So it's actually become way more than just a search engine. And I think some of the, the really strong use cases these days recently tend to be around analytics. And at the filter, it's our primary data store. And we used to use Microsoft SQL Server as our primary data store. And that's gradually more and more taking a back seat. We still use it a little bit. Um, but Elasticsearch is basically our primary data store. OK. So let's do some Elastic. <laughs> Um, there's a couple of tools which I'll introduce you to. One is COP and the other is Sense. And they're really the, the kind of key tools that you'll use for, into, uh, for working with Elastic. And they give you an overview of everything that's going on and make your life so much easier. So those two are really idle friends. So and we're going to do a, a few things. And we'll have a look at some data that I've already got into Elastic Search. We'll do some searching for some kind of plain old search use case. Um, then we'll kind of advance that and do fuzzy search, um, looking at geolocated search. And actually, we'll do some very, very basic analytics. So, let me switch to. Uh, okay. Uh, let's make this a bit bigger. How's that? Is that legible? Make it full screen, that might get with the top part of the top. Okay, um, so 
this is a one node plastic cluster. Um, the node here, um, I've started up. Um, Elastic has this thing with Marvel characters, so when you start up a node by default, it, it makes itself up a name that's based on a randomly generated Marvel, Marvel Comics character. Um, <laughs> so I'll, I'll add a few more later and we'll see what it comes up with. Um, so, um, this is one node. This is my data. Um, tweet stream here is an index, so an index is a little bit like a table. Um, so you can segment your data into separate indexes. Each index is built out of shards. So I've got five shards here. I've got shards 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And that comes in for scalability and for data redundancy, basically. And so we'll see a little bit more of that later, so I'll come back to that. But this is just one index. Um, so this tool is COPF, which is just a view onto Elastic. It doesn't come with Elastic Search as a plugin. It has a plugin architecture. You install it over the top of the Elastic, and it gives you an overview of what, what the cluster is doing. Um, there's also a node view, which gives you a little bit of information about CPU usage, how much disk space you've got, and um, how long the node's been up, and so on and so on. Okay. So another tool that we've got is Marvel. Um, so, so I should say the COPF is a free tool. Um, Elastic is an open source product, you can use it for nothing. Um, COPF is a free plugin, it's open source, you can download it and install it. Um, Marvel is made by Elastic, the company. Um, it's a really, really good tool for uh, advanced monitoring of your cluster. Um, it's free to use in development environments, so while you're developing a product, superb. Um, it does cost you um, to, to use it in a, in a production environment, so just kind of bear that in mind. So let's, let's see what we've got in this, in this index. Um, Elasticsearch is a RESTful API, so I'm literally kind of making an HTTP POST request here. And the resources is the index, tweet stream. Um, an index can contain multiple types. In this case, I've only got one. I've got some statuses in here. But these are actually tweets, tweet statuses. Um, something that I put in earlier. And I'm going to make a search. I don't want to put any constraints on the search at all. It's just a wide open search showing all the data that's in here. So, okay. So I was able to search all that data in four milliseconds. Um, so what we get back um, is basically JSON. Um, JSON is what we put in. The documents that we put in are in JSON. The documents that come out are in JSON. And the query language that you use to query everything is JSON, so it's actually a really nice sort of intuitive language to um, you know, everything's in JSON format. It's schemaless because it's a NoSQL database, so you can quite flexibly shape documents. Um, so I get a little bit of information back from my results there. So the first thing is how long it took. Um, it tells me how many shards it queried. Um, there were five shards. All five shards returned a successful response and none failed. So you can have a partial shard failure and you'll still get results back. If some of your shards are unavailable for you, you'll still get some results back. And it's very quickly told me that there's 6,200 documents in here. And then, then I get the hits back. This is the actual data itself. So, you know, you start to see information um, that's I've ingested previously from Twitter. I'm literally uh, plugged into Twitter and I'll show you how we did this later. Um, converted it into a JSON document, threw it at the, at the database, and here it is. It tells me when the tweet was created, what the text of the tweet was, whether it was favorited or not, how many times it was retweeted. There's all sorts of stuff in here that comes straight out of the Twitter streaming engine, or streaming API. Um, it's this list uses that were mentioned, pulls out the individual URLs, pulls out the hashtags. So there's all sorts of kind of semi-structured data in here. So let's move on a little bit. Um, let's try and do a search that's a bit more focused. Um, so there's, there's, there's kind of too much data here. We don't want to see all this stuff. We want to see when a few more results with a bit less information. Um, so I'm going to only bring back the text of the tweet, when it was created, 
the username and the user location, keep it a bit, a bit more restricted. And the query uh, is basically a term query. So I'm, doing, I'm saying, for the text field, let's look for the word Rihanna. Um, the data that I've ingested here is actually from a stream of hashtag now playing data. So it's all generally user data. So let, let's see what, what tweets we have in here that relate to Rihanna. I know there'll be some because it's uh, a big popular artist. So, still only took a couple of milliseconds to come back. I've seen a slightly cleaner representation of the data, now, just the text, and retweeted it. Um, so, okay, Drake featuring Rihanna. It's played. Um, Rihanna, better have my money on. Uh, Hong Kong was played. So, we're starting to get some really useful information pulled out of this Twitter stream. And I was able to search for that very, very quickly. I can change this to um, a different artist and execute it. It comes back very, very quickly. So there's no kind of, um, if you imagine doing something like this in, in SQL, you'd be willing to put um, indexing over the top of your data to be able to get the responses back very quickly. If it was full text search, you were thinking about, you know, how do you break this apart and shred it into its terms? Actually, all the data was shredded and indexed so that you can do these searches very, very quickly. Um, if I want to search on um, a different field, I can do that instead. It works just as quickly. So now I'm bringing back tweets where there's the James and the username. So this, this is an interesting thing. We find this very, very useful with the filter. Um, we started with NoSQL using MongoDB. Um, and actually found that we had very flexible data because we were dealing with a lot of different customers and storing data in their own format. Um, and when we moved to Elasticsearch, oh, sorry, when we were Mon working with Mongo, we had to know the shape of the queries that were going to be run before we executed them, otherwise they ran dog slow. In Elasticsearch, everything's indexed by default um, and actually runs really, really quickly. And we never had to, we haven't had to really do index optimization, it just isn't a thing you have to do in Elasticsearch really good for a very flexible data set, especially for multi-tenancy for us. Okay. Um, that's an exact match. Um, that's not a very good search engine to only do exact matches, so if I kind of drop the H out of Rihanna, I'm expecting to get the results back. Yeah, nothing. So let's do a little bit of fuzzy search. Um, so it's a very similar query. I'm posting a request to search to the tweet stream to get the status. It's a search request. I'm um, restricting the data that I'm bringing back again so that we don't get overwhelmed with too much data. But this time, the query fuzzy and the text is Rihanna spelled really badly. Okay, that was maybe not quite what we were looking for. Diana. Pretty close. You can sort of see how it's related. So the, the, the edit distance that is, is pretty close. So we put a result like that. That wasn't what I was expecting. Diana Crawl, Ariana Grande. Okay, it's not even necessarily just the beginning. So you know, not quite what we were expecting. So that's that's a bit of a naive, fuzzy search. Um, so let's let's take that again. And we'll add an extra parameter into the fuzzy search. We put a prefix length on here, so when people search, they generally get the first character right, and after that, the spelling sometimes goes a little bit off, off piste. Um, one of the things that we've seen in search is um, we've seen fairly common usage. I think 37 different variations of the spelling of Alanis Morissette. So, <laughs> I'm sure there are more, but those are the common common variants. So. So let, let's put a prefix on I mean, This is something that Elasticsearch does out of the box. You just say, okay, do the fuzzy search, but now I'm going to make sure the prefix of these matches. Um, okay, great work this time. So I'm getting stuff out that's got Rihanna in there. Um, okay, so it looks like we've got a fuzzy search that works now. Um, it's not very much code there in terms of the JSON to make a fuzzy search, but it's just a handful of lines of JSON, which is quite neat. What about if we want to search for tweets that are near us? 
Um, so some of the Twitter data has geolocation in it, some doesn't. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is filter down the data set and say, only return the results where it has a geolocation. Um, and I'm going to develop a, a, a order the results by a function score that's Gaussian, so it's, it's kind of a curve, um, based on the geolocation. And the origin is, you will recognize that long, that's actually here. <laughs> um, and actually we put a scale in here which says how quickly we want the curve to decay. Um, it doesn't really matter too much in terms of the order of the results. So, again, all JSON. Um, actually one of the things I should probably point out in here is, is um, one of the beauties of Sense for building these things is you get kind of auto-completion. So it's actually aware of the data. So if I go in here and I can type GE and I start to get geolocation. So actually building queries is pretty automatic. You can grow them very, very quickly. Because as you type. So let's run this and see what's happening in here. Okay, Gloucester. It's not very close, but it is close. Um, where is it going there? Uh, Surrey. Okay, I haven't got very much data in here, so we're getting quite far away. But bearing in mind this is a global global stream of data. Got some stuff in Surrey. Okay. So, um, you, know, you can see these different bits of queries that start to combine together. So, if I'm doing a functional score and a fuzzy match, I can say, find me tweets for things that look a bit like Rhiannon but might be spelled out quite correctly, but are also quite nearby. And you can decide how important the nearby is and how important the Rihanna is. Um, it might be that Rihanna is really important or nearby is really important. Start to combine these things and create your own score. Okay. So all that was about search and document retrieval. So I would set up the show as a little bit of analytics. Um, obviously, you don't really have very much data in here, and it's not the best data for analytics. But let's try something. Um, so I'll do something in here that perhaps seems a little bit strange. Set the size of the number of results that I want to come back to zero. So I actually don't want the results themselves back. I don't really want any of the results back. I only want the analytics back. So one of the really powerful features that Elasticsearch offers is its ability to do aggregations. Um, you can have multiple aggregations and run them all at the same time. Um, you have to give each aggregation a name. I'm going to call this one um, artist. It, it relates to the query. So terms, I'm going to pull some terms out of the text, um, out of the index text. Um, so there's the field that I want to pull the terms from. I'm going to bring back the 10 most popular terms, um, but I want to restrict those terms to Rihanna, Drake, Coldplay, <coughs> and U2, Goldsmith, Barry, a handful of artists. Keep it simple, otherwise we'll get lots of stuff like buy and the and other nonsense. So. Okay. So aggregations also run pretty quickly. You know, search is talking you know, small numbers of milliseconds. Aggregations, the same kind of thing. And that's driven. Can I ask a question about aggregations? Yeah, yeah. To, to the same point you made about the indices, there's no kind of. No, there's nothing. Do. There's nothing to, yeah. to do in, a, in advance to make aggregations, but they actually work with the same data as the search. Um, it's, it's all really it's backed on Lucene indexes, and the fact that you've got the Lucene behind there. It's an inverted index which gives you terms and scores, so actually aggregations is a, is, is a byproduct of that. It's a really, really powerful one. So these aggregations where that comes back, okay, only 6,000 documents, so we're not really stretching things here. But if there were 6 million documents, it still comes back you know, in 50, 60, 100 milliseconds, so it's a quick an analytics. And if we update the data set, the analytics updates too, so we get quite good real-time analytics out of this. It's a really powerful feature. Um, okay, so it's just giving us like out of those pre-selected artists that we've selected, this fairly limited data set. Okay, Drake's the most popular, then Rihanna, then Barry, and Coldplay, and two, and then. So, so it's, you know, that's a very whistle-stop tour into some of the functionality that Elasticsearch offers. Um, one of the key things that makes it work for us in the filter is the fact that we can scale it. Um, 
So let's do the, the, the hand at the top. Okay. Okay. So you saw from. Let's see if we can find some of these things so far. Okay. So this little command window. That's my Elasticsearch node. Don't worry about the contents in it. That's Elasticsearch running. Um, I'm going to fire up another one. Uh, let's watch. Let's see if we can get this to work. Let's see if we can see what's going on. Okay. So there's not much data in here, so you have to watch this quite quickly as it, start, as it starts to do uh, as a new node joins. So in Windows that's just Elasticsearch.bat. It fires up a new node. Um, oh, I thought I'd turn it off. Change that order. The default behaviour for Elasticsearch is to use multicast so the nodes discover each other. And obviously, I'm not showing great scalability putting two nodes onto one machine here. Um, it's going to be somewhat limited. Just wait for the other node to arrive. It's decided to call itself Unus the Untouchable. <laughs> you can take over this, you don't have to call them this. There's no names, you can give them slightly more IT type names if you like. Come on, demo. It's probably something to do with my firewall. Oh, how embarrassing. <laughs> um, uh, okay, I'll give up on that. What normally happens <laughs> is an extra node appears here, and then some of these shards will move themselves over to the node. Um, it will naturally, oh, initially, okay, no, that's not quite true. So I've got five green shards. These shards are, are data that's allocated onto the cluster. I've actually got five grey shards as well. So the default setup for Elasticsearch is that each, um, each shard has a replica. There's one primary and one replica. You can put more replicas if you like. And as you introduce a second node, those replicas that are currently unassigned are assigned onto the second node. So now you've got two copies of your data. So you've got some redundancy and the node should fail. But if you introduce a third <coughs> node, some of the shards will move off each of the two nodes that you have already onto a third node. So now you're starting to scale out the system as well as get the redundancy. So the more nodes you have, the more your data spreads out. And if you want to increase the replication of the data so that it's in more places, you can choose to do that on an index by index basis. So if I have 500 nodes and I want 200 copies of the data, I can do that. So more copies of the data means more read scalability, and spreading the data across more nodes with less replicas means better write scalability. So for us, Elasticsearch is a great product that gives us really good write scalability as well as read scalability. Um, and I think in some, you know, a lot of other products maybe write scalability is a lot harder to do. But here it's actually pretty trivial. Sorry, you, what gives you write scalability? More nodes, less replicas. Uh, write scalability you get primarily by spreading the data across more nodes. It's basically on more spinning disks because it's, on, yeah, it's spread across more nodes. So if I have, you know, for the best write scalability here, I have five data nodes because I've got five shards. So that's kind of more than last. So yeah, they're effectively 
one of these nodes is one of the star is the master, and the other two that haven't appeared would have no star. So what is a self-electing master? And what about invisibility then? Because it can instantly invade all of the other nodes, or does that make Yes, the, the cost of state is passed around, so as long as the data exists in one location, it's available immediately and forgets. Um, searches come a little bit later. There's a, there's a refresh process that runs in the background that you can set to run on a particular frequency. The default is one second, so it becomes available to search, to do fuzzy searches, typically one second. And that applies to ad aggregations too. How would you access it? Would you just load balance it and just do that? Or is there one endpoint that the whole node presents to you that you hit? Let me, let me whiz on and oh, okay. no, try just and get yeah, no, 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 cool. no, no, um, There's lots of good questions about how you scale this thing out, so we'll give you questions for the end. Okay, um, so what didn't kind of work here was scale out. Um, and what I was also going to do was then break some stuff. It's going to kill one of the nodes and show you the, actually the data. The cluster state goes from a nice green colour to an orange colour to something that has gone a little bit wrong. If it's orange, some of the, the data is still somewhere. If it's red, some of the data is missing. So yeah, that's a really bad state. If orange is okay, and you generally go from orange back to green, it'll, it'll move the data around to, to make sure that the replicas are, there are enough replicas of all the data to have in the frame. So there's some stuff um, that um, some stuff that Elasticsearch doesn't do. Um, it's not really a batch processing engine. Um, um, it's um, it's not great. At, um, actually, if you want to run business logic inside it, it's not really there. It's really about just querying the data and now. So it's very, very powerful applications and very powerful querying functionality. But it doesn't do this batch processing for large scale data processing. So we've kind of paired this with Apache Spark. So it's, it's um, um, open source, fast, general, very, very general engine for large scale data processing. It's super speedy. So if you typically use quoted as if you compare it to Hadoop, which bounces all its data off disk at every step of processing. It's typically 100 times faster than that because all the processing by default operates in memory. Um, it's very easy to use. It's got a, uh, an API that you can access through Java, Scala, and Python. Uh, it scales really well in the same way that it does Elasticsearch. And it's very, very flexible with lots of different components that you could draw on. So the core is the, is the core processing engine. But actually, you can write SQL style queries against this. So Elasticsearch is a no SQL database. But actually, if you pair it with Apache Spark, you can start to write SQL queries and do joins. Um, so you can bring in join back to NoSQL. Um, I'm probably not going to get through everything. <laughs> but let's do a simple Spark demo. Um, so let me make this bigger. The pizza hasn't arrived yet. So. Does it not? Okay. <laughs> so, um, a, a Spark job starts with some configuration. Um, I give my application and my job that I want to run, I give it a name. So, um, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to count some words in a big text file. It's actually the complete works of Shakespeare in a, in a text file. Call my app, word count, um, I tell it where I want to run it. I'm actually going to run it locally, and I want it to use four cores, so that's the local square brackets four. The job runs in a context, so create a new context, and for, for those that don't recognise the syntax, this is Scala, and you can equally use Java or Python to do the same thing. Um, create the Spark context with the config that I've just defined. Um, the context has lots of powerful functions, so um, I can populate something called an RDD, which is a, a resilient distributed data set um, directly from a text file. So if I have a text file, I can pull it in and I can load it into a distributed data set which lives on multiple nodes. Um, it's basically a, an innumerable or an iterable set of stuff, so each line of the text file becomes an element in my RDD. Um, so 
what I'm going to do is count the words in there. So, okay, here's my text file that I've defined. First thing I'm going to do is take each line in that file and split it in space so that I'm getting the words out of that line rather than the whole line. So that gives me an array for each line. And flat map takes each of those arrays, joins them together, and returns them as a new RDD that I can then do other operations on. Um, kind of keep it interesting rather than doing buys and is and at. Those words are going to be pretty frequent. So let's filter it for words that have got more than four characters. Um, I also don't really care about the casing, if it's capitalised or not. Um, if there's um, quotation marks around something or hyphens, let, let's get rid of all those. So let's do a bit of, bit of cleaning up on the data. Um, so what I have now is a whole list of words. It's every word that occurs individually in the entire works of Shakespeare. So I'm going to change that. So for each word, I'm going to create a tuple. Um, and that tuple is the word itself and the integer 1. So this is where I can kind of map reduce. Um, is people familiar with map reduce? The idea of map reduce? So I start with all these words and a score of 1. Um, there's a built-in function again on, on an RDD. All of the returns of these things are still RDDs. Um, I can reduce it by the key. So the key is the word, it's the first element in the tuple. So I'm grouping together all the things that have the same, same word, and I'm summing um, the, the value parts, which initially were all ones. So every time there's two A's, each one had a one, sum them together, I get a two. But then that set can then be summed again with other A's from other distributed data, other parts of the distributed data set. So eventually they will have the sum total of the occurrences for each word. Um, at that point, some effort's gone into calculating that data set. So I'm going to do another couple of things on it. So to make sure that it's always available for the next couple of processes, I actually will cache it there and say, actually, in real time, onto this. It's kind of a hint, a spark to keep this thing hanging around. Otherwise, it will go back to square one and re um, recalculate stuff. That's the whole point of the resilient um, part of the resilient distributed data set. Um, if it, it's broken or destroyed or becomes unavailable for any reason, if your node fails, Spark knows how to recreate that thing from its raw parts. So it, it understands the steps that I've gone through to get to the point that I can say, okay, now cache it. So if I lose a node, it can catch up, it can get back to where you left off. So let, let's have some output and count the actual number of words in there and output that to the song. <coughs> and then we'll start looking at actually popular words um, basically sort them by the, the number of occurrences and then I'm going to print out the top 50. Okay? Okay, let's run this thing and see what happens. Should get a console down the bottom side. Hopefully one of my demos will work properly. Um, Spark's very verbose. It tells you about everything it's doing. Um, gives you lots of warnings, lots of information. And it all comes through, um, basically through the standard I.O. apps. Um, which actually scales really, really nicely. So, come on. I ran this in the office and it worked absolutely <laughs> Something like the 13th most popular word was exeunt. 
exit stage right, which I think is probably what I should do now. <laughs> <laughs> So we talked about RGDs. Um, so the, the notion behind this is that um, what we did is we configured our job and that we did in the client. So that's that's run on your local machine. Loading the data from the text file happens out on your remote workers, so that's distributed and scales out. Um, we broke it down into words, that happens on the workers too. Cleaned it up a bit, got rid of the, brought everything into lowercase, got rid of the punctuation. Count the word occurrences, sort the word occurrences, all that can happen on as many nodes as you like. So if you have a very, very big text file, you can distribute that job across. It should run as well on a thousand nodes as it ran on my machine. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, it's only this bit where you want the results back that you have to run locally. So you know, when you're developing stuff, you can develop it locally and then be happy that it works on a small data set and then take it to a big cluster, run the exact same code on a thousand nodes and it should work just the same. So you don't need to know about scalability, that's the view now, it's the transparency. So, um, so um, Elastic, <coughs> back to Elastic, it's a great data store. Um, it scales really, really well, but it doesn't do this complex batch processing. It's not great at extra transport and load. You end up building a tool set to help it to do those sorts of things. Um, when we were doing that, we were building all the stuff in C-sharp. Um, but if we join Spark with Elastic, there's a connector for the two. Um, uh, Elastic Search Spark, which does let us do both of those things together. So I had another demo, but I don't think we were going to attempt it. Which was to hook up to the uh, live Twitter stream, which is actually how I ingested the data really. Um, and index that data as it happens, straight into Elastic, and then show them the query. Um, um, so this Elastic Search Spark connector is actually really, really powerful. It lets you do uh, build RGDs, not only put data into Elastic Search, but also get data out of Elastic Search. So Elastic Search, the data is naturally distributed. Um, if you connect that, join it with Spark. Spark and the connector is, is smart enough to know to bring the data that's on a local node to a local worker. So it actually doesn't have to bring the data across the network. So if you've got five workers and five shards will bring the data from each shard to that local worker. Do as much work as it can locally, only exchange data when it needs to, which is actually why things like join start to work again in MySQL database. Um, and there's a, there's a plugin as well, or a part of the core Spark, um, which actually lets you do SQL. I mentioned you can, you can actually write SQL style, select star from a NoSQL database, and you can join, it. You can join indexes in the NoSQL database using the classic old school Beautiful that we're all familiar with SQL statements, which is really, really nice. Uh, the distributed re index thing um, if you change your schema or you want to change the way that Elasticsearch understands fields, you find yourself re indexing data in Elasticsearch. You have to copy it from one index to another because data is basically the schema is dynamic, but the first time you put data in, you're stuck with it. So you have to copy it to a new index. And actually, Spark proved to be a really good tool for helping with that. There's loads of functionality. Um, the two complement each other really, really well. So that's why I thought I'd bring it to talk to you guys later. Right. Um, if you want to see more brilliant demos like today, <laughs> um, um, I actually run a, a, a meetup group um, for Elastic or Elasticsearch, um, either in Bath or Bristol. Um, I haven't got a placeholder of scheduled at the moment, but not actually anything specific planned. So, but join up in the community if you're interested to see more coming along. Um, yeah, and we'll, we'll get something scheduled and we'll try and get some speakers in and do a little bit more. So. Don't have any time. Do you have time for any questions? Well, we do because the pizza is still I don't have any with the pizza. So, yeah. It's all planned. Yeah. <laughs> Luckily, we have. Yeah, yeah. Oh, here it is. We do have time for yeah. five, five, ten minutes of questions. Okay, cool. Uh, I have a couple of loose questions. Yeah. Um, we've always used Elasticsearch kind of with a relational database to right. do our search queries. Yeah. Like 
is the move to kind of elastic to establish itself as kind of a database except instead of this? Yeah, that's a really good question. We, we're seeing more and more people actually starting to use Elastic as a primary data store. And the official line from the guys that write Elastic is probably shouldn't do this. Right. Um, <laughs> if, it depends what data you put in there. Um, we don't carry financial transaction data. Um, you know, the information that's in there, we, we, could, we basically scale those to really, really important the consistency less so for our use case. So it works really, really well for us as a primary data store. And we actually flow data now. So it goes into Elasticsearch first and we treat that as a primary, but we do flow some data down into Microsoft SQL Server. Um, so that we do put that transactional um, consistency. Um, if we lose a lot of data before that happens, we can live with that. If, if in your use case you can't live with it, think very carefully about it. But it's, it's actually proved to be pretty robust in terms of retaining data and the fact that it's multi-node, you know, those kind of things are actually kind of harder to do in relational databases. To have proper multi-server read scalability, yeah maybe, my scalability is actually really hard. It's, it's kind of enterprise level stuff to be able to do my scalability. So. The second part of that was, with all the indexing and kind of fuzzy searching and all that, Presumably, it has quite a total on both disk space and the CPU. Yeah. Um, we, we, before the NoSQL databases came along, we were building more or less a NoSQL database inside a relational database by kind of shredding the data into key values. And um, the footprint of that on disk is was typically <coughs> two and a half times bigger than, than the equivalent footprint. Search. So actually, it takes up significantly less space, like for like, in our use case. Your mileage may vary. So footprint, no, no big deal. Um, we throw quite a lot of data with this. Um, we've now got some quite big servers running it, um, but it hardly touches the sides. It's, it's pretty low CPU usage. Um, read is uh, read processes. You know, actually querying and reading is actually very, very cheap. If you're throwing lots of heavy data at it. You might want to spread that out over, over a period of time, you can possibly slow it down. It's pretty efficient. I mean, Lucene's a, a long lived, very, very stable quality product, and it's quite efficient. So. Yeah, um, you posted lots of data. Can you actually delete data out of it yes. if you wanted to? Yeah. And can you give it like time lived length of time? Yes. Yeah. So that's so you can say it's only I wanted like the last hour. Yeah, so yeah. Like that streaming thing, you might say. You only want the last hour's worth yeah, of data. When, when you post the document into Elasticsearch, one of the options that's over to you is actually to put the TTL on the document, and it automatically will disappear after that period of time. Okay, cool. So like the real <coughs> kind of cool, the TTL in the keys. Yeah. And like and stuff. Okay, cool. So that's the TTL. Yeah. The, the only other question I had was, how does the scaling work? Do you just load balance the whole cluster, or do you have like a right. master point so, that you get to? Um, when you, if you really want to scale this out, um, there's a few functions that, well, there's three different functions, I guess, that um, Elasticsearch does. Um, one is the master, which coordinates the state of the cluster and makes sure that everybody's talking to each other and everybody knows what's going on. Um, ideally, you want three of those. One's elected and active at any given time, and the other two are there so that you, know, you always have an odd numbers and, and say that two have to agree on who the master is. For it so to be three elected. is your smallest cluster. So three is the smallest number of masters, really. Um, as your cluster gets very big, uh, the number of shards gets very high. Um, those nodes can be quite stressed, so uh, or the active master could be quite stressed, so they can be quite resource. It can be a bit of a resource bottleneck. Yeah. Probably more than the size of the data with the number of shards you have. To can you actually take the shards off the master? Uh, yes. So yes. you so just upload them separately. So you spin up any given Elastic search node. You can tell it whether it's a master. You can tell it whether it's a data node, which is, means it actually carries the data. And the third and final role is, is the load in a load balancer. So a load balancer isn't a master, it doesn't carry any data, it just knows where the other nodes in the cluster are. So, so typically you can use that you would put a load balancer local to your application that's called in the cluster. So you pretty much know that's going to be there. And then that load balancer can then actually spread the distribute the load across the remainder of the cluster automatically. And actually yeah. it will hit multiple nodes and bring the data back. Can you have lots of load balancers? Yes. So okay, so that that's my question. So you could 
on every single app server you have, have a load balance if you yeah. wanted to. So you get some distribution, it's random, completely random, but if one of your app servers went down, your whole, you wouldn't have one single point, which is your yeah. load balance are going offline, I think. No, no, load balance, typically load balance per app server. Okay, every cool. point where you want to access your cluster, stick a load balance on. Cheap and cheap. Yeah, it's really simple scalability. But the load balancers don't use much resource, they're very lightweight, so you're running a couple of hundred meter round. Oh. Yeah, one, one more. Oh, we'll have a cold pizza. Yeah, I was going to ask, uh, you were using Mongo before. Yeah. Uh, you, you, by moving to Elastic, you don't have to index. We don't have to think about what index, about what index, about what index, index right. you know, about optimizing index. Right. So what stuff. have you lost? Because I guess, you know, um, software, right? so. the only thing I think we lost was the ability to do um, for, like auto increment encounters. Okay. It was a thing that you could basically say increment the value within a document, and that was atomic and quite lightweight. You didn't lose it very much. Um, everything else it seems to be more or less. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I had a interesting. We went, I went to. Um, the Mongo conference a few years ago, the, the CTO was, was talking actually, and, he, and one of the things that he said was that um, basically he was talking about sharding. We were hitting this problem of like we want to shard the data out to get the right scalability. And the CTO stood up in front of the whole audience. This is quite a few years ago, so things may have moved on. So he said basically, don't do sharding unless you absolutely have to. It was a don't pursue this thing, right scales. Read scale is brilliant, it's really, really easy. But they had a big right block issue, didn't they? But they had some right block issues. They put a lot of work into it, so I think it's much better. But that was where it was coming from. Whereas I'd last to search actually with right scale from the very early days. So it meant I need to break very well. Okay, there is pizza, it's arrived. Um, thank you to Neil and, and Jamie.